Welcome to a part two of my video looking at uh, creation in the 21st century, Carl Bauer's television program featuring uh, Canadian creationist Ian Juby. Uh, just going to get started. He was discussing uh, Archaeopteryx, and I will continue with that. We're going to go on in that in a little minute, but let's address that issue first of all. Is it an intermediate? We have modern birds today which have claws in the wingtips. Now that's an amazing discovery. Uh, yes, and I stopped in to visit a whole pile in Arizona. All right, this is a game called One of These Things is Not Like the Other. Those of you raised on Sesame Street might remember. Um, here is a, this is a, this is a diagram of three different hands. Now, the top one is the hand of a modern bird, what we would call the wing. Uh, the, sen the middle one is Archaeopteryx, and the bottom one is Deinonychus, uh, the Dromaeosaur, Manoreptoran, Dinosaur, uh, you may, if you've seen Jurassic Park. A uh, larger version of the Velociraptor um, is, is a, probably a fair way to describe it. Um, it is pretty clear that, well, two of these look really similar, um, and one of them looks dramatically different. And it's obviously the bird's wing is um, what has changed in this. And we see these transitions not in Archaeopteryx, but we see in the other other early birds. Uh, remember, Ar Archaeopteryx is just one one species, maybe two species actually, but one um, now out of China we're getting abundant fossils of a whole host of, of these intermediate bird dinosaur things. It's a it's pretty amazing time to be if you're interested in studying that transition you, you couldn't pick a better time to be around. Um, but you see that in the bird the the upper two digits are fused together and in, if you look at those upper same upper two digits in the birds like the ratites, the ostrich or the, the hoatzin uh, that's where the claw would be, as on the distal end of those two fingers, or on one of those fingers, depending on, on what group it is. Now, a number of birds have that feature. Um, but it's not the same thing uh, as I was discussing in the previous video. You look at the Archaeopteryx had free fingers. Free, not three, although it does have three as well. Meaning the fingers extended from the wing and were partially prehensile. Uh, this, this is what's given weight to the idea that possibly Archaeopteryx uh, was arboreal and that it spent most of its time climbing around in the tree canopy and then sort of like a flying squirrel would sail between even though they were capable of powered flight um, not very efficient flight that they would sail between trees you know to get from tree to tree or to cut open spaces in the forest canopy um, but that that's irrelevant as to with that that's one of the one of the controversial ideas about the evolution of flight the evolution of Archaeopteryx um, but what is important is is that the fingers extended outward they were they were jointed fingers that extended from the wing. Uh, no modern bird has anything remotely resembling that. All modern birds have a wing pretty much built on the design that I'm showing here. Um, and you see that design again is really really close to uh, the Dromaeosaurids, uh, the the um, Deinonychus, Velociraptor, Uteraptor, that whole group of Manoreptorans, or the, as they're called, um, have a have hands built on the same pattern as Archaeopteryx does. And what's even more amazing is if you look at the feet, um, if you remember Jurassic Park, our, the, the Velociraptor had that toe it could cock upward and then slash outward with. Well, Archaeopteryx didn't have the slashing toe, but they had the same cocking mechanism. And we now have uh, Rowan Avis, I believe, is one of the fossil birds uh, that has the same slashing claw that Velociraptor had. So that's kind of in interesting as well. In addition to the clawed hands, the dinosaur-like feet, and the toothed um, jaw that uh, Ian Juby is going to discuss here soon, a cladistic analysis of Archaeopteryx had showed 80 different characteristics of Archaeopteryx that grouped it with the Dromaeosaurid dinosaurs and not modern birds, uh, which in, in, by every single definition known makes it a perfect transitional fossil. Now, as for the teeth in the beak, uh, there's a little bird, which is about, oh, about that big in South America, a hummingbird, and it has teeth in its beak. And they've now been studying it for mm, pretty close to two decades, and they still don't know what the teeth are used for. You know, I, I, I really, more than coming to understand that these creation speakers, these creation lecturers, are really, truly shameless people. Uh, there is practically no claim so ridiculous, so outrageously false 
uh, that they won't use if it sounds good, if it will convince the already convinced, if it will, you know, get people to donate money to them, they'll lie through their teeth. Um, and again, either they're absolutely painfully ignorant or they're lying. And I'm going to take, I truly am citing for the latter on that one. Uh, and this is a great example. He's talking about the tooth-beaked hummingbird found in, in South America. Uh, it's one of the uh, fairly uncommon hummingbird species that has, along its bill, tiny little serrations on its beak. These are not teeth. The teeth of Archaeopteryx are embedded in the jawbone, in the maxilla. All right, They have roots. They're, they're teeth, just like you see in a lizard, in a dinosaur, in a mammal. They're true teeth. The beak of a bird is not is a separate thing. It's it's a it's an evolved structure on top of the jaw complex. The to, so the teeth of this hummingbird are not teeth in any sense of the word. There's certainly no comparison to the teeth of Archaeopteryx. And for him to say that, uh, it took me less than a minute to find out that little bit of information. And I'm going to suspect that he's he knows exactly that that's false. Um, but it gets a big wow out of the audience, right? Um, that's that's these guys are um, hucksters of the po of the worst possible d degree. Um, and uh, the other thing is, well, they still don't know what the teeth are for. Really, you're gonna stick to that, there, Mr. Juby? Uh, even though the the hummingbird has been seen using its serrated beak to pull spiders and millipedes out of crevices and stuff. Um, we know pretty well what it's used for, and it's been known for a long time what the serrations are for. Uh, you just, I don't know why, what, what, what the need was to throw that in there. I guess to make it, I don't know, to further show how little we scientists actually know about the natural world that we're claiming to be studying. Well, Ian, what's the answer? Well, I think it's personally the global flood. Yes. We're talking about not just rapid burial. Uh, in a second, I'll explain why I think it was buried alive. Uh, we're not just referring to rapid burial. We're talking about rapid burial under enormous amounts of sediments before the bird rotted, yes. before it turned to rock, before the sediments it was buried in turned to rock. In fact, while it was still rather pliable. Uh, yes. Now... Here's the catch. This is common in the fossil record. Ah, so, now let's break down here what, what, what exactly he's saying. So, he is taking the opinion that when we find a fossil, like Archaeopteryx, that it's evidence that it was buried fairly quickly, um, that pressure and such, that it was actually buried in soft sediments, not buried in rock, um, that, it, that there was pressure and weight, you know, lithification processes that did it. Now, this is in sharp contrast to, you know, us evolutionists that, you know, we believe that, well, fossils are formed when an animal dies on the surface and just lays there for a long time and then, um, you know, eventually burrows itself into a solid rock. No, I'm serious. To be, to be, I'm sorry, I'm being snarky. Uh, what he said is, and no, it doesn't, doesn't differ from any, any, no, we know that that, yes, those are the conditions under which fossils are more likely to form. Um, you get fairly rapid burial. It doesn't have to be under tremendous pressure. Um, very, very shallow sediments, like anoxic sediments, uh, are, are things decay very, very slowly in anoxic sediments, even if they're only a few centimeters under the surface. Uh, Archaeopteryx, the, the, the limestones in which Archaeopteryx formed and preserves lots of soft-bodied things fairly well, these fine-grained limestones, uh, formed in the bottom of an anoxic lake. Um, they, you know, they, they, that's no great surprise. Kurt, I brought with me a number of fossil fish from the Green River Formation, and perhaps you can hold this one up. Gladly. These are uh, uh, quite common in the Green River Formation, but again, these are, some of these are squished to less than a millimeter thick. Mm. And the skin and everything has been preserved to the point where the, where the bones actually protrude through the flesh. That is how much pressure these things have undergone. That's an incredible amount of pressure required. Yeah. Just kind of an appeal to ignorance there. Um, I don't know, does, does Ian Juby or Carl Bau or, hell, me know how much pressure it takes to, to squish a little fish down to a millimeter thickness? Um, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you the answer to that. How much does it take? 
Uh, it, you know, is it a lot? Is it a little? Um, what's the state of decay of the fish when it's being squished? You know, what these kinds of things. I mean, I've seen oh, all over the place salmon carcasses on the beach that are, oh, I'd say maybe a centimeter or two thick, um, you know, where the flesh has been mostly rotted away and they're just sort of flattened out on the surface. And that's with no pressure at all. That's just through decay processes. Um, you know, I don't, it, it, it's just a, the funny thing about it is I have I also have a number of Green River fish fossils and uh, I think it's kind of interesting uh, for so much tremendous pressure to push the bones through the skin which I don't think you can you can't determine that that's the case uh, you you have a a fairly flattened uh, barely three dimensional relief you you don't know if the bones are pushed through the skin or the whatever however that that's that's kind of a stupid thing to say. Um, but the, the the whole issue is is that enough tremendous pressure to squish it flat. He says tremendous amount of pressure, and yet most of the little bones aren't broken. Uh, I think that's kind of interesting. And experiments have been performed where they put fish, dead fish, in a cage so scavengers could not get to it, put them in the bottom of a lake, and within days the fish was completely gone from the, from disintegration, completely vanished. That gives you an idea of just how fast these were buried. Now, that point needs to be made again. That is a major point, Ian. Would you state that again? Well, basically, by observation, here we go again with good science. Yes. Observable, repeatable, predictable. And predictable. The fish disintegrate in days, even without scavengers. <laughs> so this gives us an idea of just how rapidly these were buried and, again, under enormous pressure. Look at how thin those are now. Tremendous statement. Well made. Well, I don't know about that experiment. Um, I've heard that claim made in a couple of creationist uh, sources in the past. I haven't actually seen the study that it was determined, although I have a hard time actually imagining the study as at least as it's described here. Um, I'm going to suspect that if it were done, it was for a different purpose. Um, well, I don't know. Because here's here's the question that I would have. Okay, so you got basically it's a cage experiment to study how long it takes a fish without scavengers to disintegrate um, in the bottom of a lake. Uh, first of all, uh, what was the trophic status of the lake? Um, was it was it oligotrophic? I mean, what was it? Was there a heavy bacterial load in this lake? Uh, was there a low bacterial load in this lake? Uh, what was the temperature? Um, how deep was the lake? And that's directly related to the temperature. Um, let's see, how big was the fish? Uh, let's see, what other, I mean, any number of factors. I mean, I have seen, I've seen salmon carcasses, again, uh, back to the salmon. I live in Alaska, salmon litter to the beach, litter to the stream sides, uh, months after the salmon spawn. And there's these mushed, mummified, mostly skeletonized salmon carcasses laying on the banks, just laying there. Um, months afterwards, exposed to the elements and still not disintegrated away, completely disintegrated away. Um, I'm going to guess that in certain systems, if we were to take that carcass and put it into a, oh, I say, a highly oxygenated, warm tropical lake, for example, uh, that you would get a lot faster disintegration. If you were to put it into, oh, say, the depths of Lake Baikal um, or the, the Sea of Galilee is a great example of an anoxic lake bottom where there's practically no decay going on in the in the bottom of that lake. Uh, these kinds of things. So it, 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 the experiment's meaningless, as at least as you describe it, absolutely a meaningless experiment. And it says nothing about um, the Green River fossils. Or until it, there's no information contained whatsoever about those fossils based on the experiment you described. And interestingly, the most common fossil found in the Morrison Formation among the dinosaur remains is fossil clams. This isn't a criticism, just a comment. Uh, the Morrison Formation, I've had opportunity to explore um, outcroppings of the Morrison uh, Formation. Um, an amazing opportunity if you ever find yourself, any of you, around um, such things. It's really worth, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Here, here's a picture we took. All right, there's not really enough time for me to show the next clip, uh, so I will take it up in part three. Uh, thank you for watching.